who we are as Eastern Africa, a total of 18 countries and two dependencies. Population uh, of the region was estimated at about 455 million and continuing to grow. And it, I think it's key as we talk about uh, smallholder farmers to just note that 70% of the population live in rural areas. And we also have some of the world's fastest growing economies, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and South Sudan have been confirmed to be part of the fastest growing economies. I will look at the demographics of pig, in, uh, pig production in Eastern Africa and just highlight that the industry is quite dynamic and rapidly growing. And this is also just to support the growing population who have quite a high demand of pork products. You know, we are having seen changing tests in consumption, uh, increased in incomes uh, are also driving this uh, growth in pork uh, demand and there's also urbanization. I think there are also other factors that uh, it is worth highlighting that are contributing to this increase. Um, there have been quite a few concerns on food safety and health. Um, environment and animal welfare, convenience and quality. So where people are convinced that um, uh, they can be guaranteed the safety of the meat they are consuming, that the animals were produced in a welfare friendly manner and all, they're switching to pork. And as far as um, most countries are concerned, once you can confirm this, then you have, you have quite uh, an increase in, in interest in pork production. Um, majority of the producers in the region are small-scale farmers. This had, uh, has been highlighted by the previous two speakers for their regions and for Africa as a whole. So we have greater than 70% uh, being small-scale pig farmers. And um, this is contributing, by virtue of this, it's contributing quite heavily to improving livelihoods and enhancing food security in the region. Breeds that are kept are quite diverse. We have indigenous breeds, exotic uh, breeds or crosses of the two. So dependent on the, I'll say the production system being practiced, you would find a mix of this. The small scale holders tend to have maybe indigenous or crosses of the indigenous and the exotic, while the large scale producers favor the exotic uh, breeds for uh, their production. Uh, the system is, uh, the industry is quite capital intensive across the entire value chain, from primary production all the way to processing. Therefore significant, um, investment is required for one to actually, you know, uh, looking at the economies of scale for the production to be profitable. And uh, mostly this would be again for the middle to uh, large scale producers who are looking at investing healthily, because as previous, previous, uh, previous uh, speakers have commented, uh, usually there's very little investment in the small scale sector. I will look at the population, uh, the peak population in the region, um, have uh, compared their Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and Western Africa. According to FAO statistics in 2019, Eastern Africa has the highest uh, pig population. That's the blue mark there, the blue line. Um, we are estimated to have about 17.5 billion pigs as of 2019. And I'm sure right now it is much higher. Um, and the numbers according to the different countries in the region are highlighted and my bit, it's the right hand side, so possibly the left hand side of the screen. You can see there was a bit of a highlight about the population of pigs in Uganda. Uh, Malawi also had quite a huge number, Madagascar, and the Zambia as well, carrying a significant number of pigs. So, as the world, one of the first speakers mentioned about what is happening in Asia and what African swine fever has done to this the pig population there. So, as uh, the populations are decreasing on that side, there's quite a significant in increase on the African continent. And for us to be able to carry on this and to feed our population, we are talking about food security here. African swine fever is one of the key challenges that we have to look at uh, managing to be able to you know, increase productivity, improve incomes by extension. Um, I've also highlighted there, again, statistics from FAO, just pointing out to the contribution of uh, uh, meat uh, from the different species. So there's the total, the first, uh, the second column there shows the total meat production uh, in the highlighted countries. And then there's the proportionate percentage uh, contributed by each species. So I've highlighted what pigs are contributing in each of the countries. And um, Uganda is leading. 
at 31%. Then we have Burundi. Ethiopia has a very small uh, pig uh, industry, but can just by virtue of looking at these numbers. Uh, Kenya and Tanzania are almost at par, but uh, as you say, there's the potential to grow, and this is 2019. And speaking from our own experiences as pharmacists here, we've seen about, uh, since 2019 to date, we've had about a 40% increase in our production. So that reflects what is happening in the country and in the region of Shua. So we have quite a number of investments by private uh, players in the Uganda pig industry and Tanzania as well. So if I'm sure the statistics at this point will be quite different. Um, my next slide highlights the production systems. As the speaker who was talking about West and Central Africa highlighted, there are quite a few similarities, so not much difference. But um, I have looked at them according to the number of uh, pigs per household or that uh, would classify them into the different uh, categories. Uh, but overall, we would be looking at free range of extensive production, uh, small to medium scale or semi-intensive production. And then you have your large scale to intensive uh, systems. Uh, the smallholder or backyard uh, producer would be having about one to 10 pigs per household. Uh, doesn't really matter whether they are the sows or growing pigs, but the total number at any one time would range from one to 10. Uh, the small to medium scale producer would have about five to 20 sows. So here you would be looking at a pig population of maybe 50 to 100 in total. The medium scale would have about 20 to 500 sows. So you're looking at anywhere from 1,000 to maybe 4,000 pigs at any one time. The large scale producers more than 500 sows. So you're looking at numbers ranging the region of um, five, uh, five, sorry, 2,000. Totality, but this also mostly depends on the productivity and the genetics that are grown. So I will highlight each system one by one. And my approach has been to highlight the value chain according to each system one at a time, uh, as opposed to having an overall uh, presentation of, uh, the of the value chain as well. So we'll start with them. Um, I have highlighted uh, what the value chain entails there. So we are looking at all the different nodes in the value chain. We are looking at input supply, where we'd be talking about our live pigs, feed, water, the veterinary services, extension services, production, which entails the feeding, uh, management of the animal. Then we have the marketing, which would basically be buying of the live pigs. And then transporting, and transporting would also fall under marketing because then transport to slaughterhouses as well. Then we'll be looking at processing, and under this, we have slaughtering, uh, value addition, chilling, packaging, and distribution. And then consumption in the region will be basically looking at domestic and export. I think one of the other things just um, coming to mind a little later, if we are looking at the input supply at the process of, uh, at the processing level, or even maybe at the very start, the input supply, there's also the aspect of uh, the pork that is imported into the region that goes into processing and then of course ends up in the, uh, in the domestic or export market again. So the free range or backyard uh, system, which would be extensive as I've highlighted, very few uh, pigs would be uh, in this system. And mostly this would be roaming freely or in some cases they would be housed in the evenings. Um, I think a hallmark of this type of system is that majority of the times the owners don't have any land. So the pigs would be maybe coming in uh, just roaming and um, identification here. I know we had a previous discussion where we were looking at how do how are such pigs identified. But I believe the owners would know where they are and when it's time to market, they would go out and look for their pigs themselves. But there are those who have uh, an enclosure in the evening where the animals would come back to the home. And again, as uh, we all know, this now has a very big impact on controlling disease, and especially in this case, uh, we are looking at Africa as well. Um, so the point number two basically points to the fact that there's very little investment in this type of system, be it in genetics or, or in housing. Um, there's poor access to veterinary, extension, financial, and market information. So again, this points to the lack of knowledge, so identifying disease or knowing what to do in the form of biosecurity or even acquiring treatment when the animals fall sick would be lacking in quite a, 
and we fight a big bully, so again, a big gap there. There will be poor husbandry and health management practices. <clears throat> uh, genetics have already pointed out that this are, that there is very little investment in genetics. So uh, there's a lot of inbreeding and um, basically just borrowing pigs from each other or buying from each other small scale producers to increase their numbers or to replace their stock as well. So I've said, as I've, uh, the next point actually highlights this, pigs are sourced from neighbors. Feed options, again, another key, um, I'll call it constraint or weakness when it comes to controlling African swine fever. You'll have these pigs scavenging from dump sites, uh, swill, which uh, ideally should be treated or cooked to kill any disease uh, carrying uh, agents. Uh, kitchen leftovers, market spoils are the options that this uh, system would have for feed. There's very little investment, if at all, in uh, commercial feeds or concentrates. Market rate is low, and pigs take very long to attain um, to attain market rate. So more than ten months. So you're looking at the housing being uh, not ideal or appropriate. You're looking at the genetic investment being very low. So inbreeding and then uh, the feeding. Uh, also now all of this add up to. Uh, to end up with the end result of the pigs taking too long to attain market weight. And again, when they do attain market weight, uh, the quality of the meat is not very good. And at the end of the day, this again uh, affects how much these uh, uh, farmers will be paid for their meat. Um, I think, again, I come back to the point where there is low input and gain in this system. And sales mostly occur during festivities or disease outbreaks. Again, that. Uh, is the problem we are trying or we are talking about today. So if you're going to sell your pigs when there's a disease outbreak, it means you're actually spreading disease. In this case, uh, uh, interests, uh, especially African swine fever, we know how it moves and how it spreads. So in this system, and most of the time, more often than not, this is where outbreaks of swine fever start. Uh, butchers and traders move from homestead to homestead. Uh, so. This would be the aggregation and from village to village, uh, buying pigs from the small scale producers. Uh, so this, they will either then go ahead and fatten them or slaughter directly or take them to slaughter directly. Um, the pie chart there just highlights uh, how, what percentage, how do I put that? How the level of uh, interaction with the slaughterhouse comes in or who takes the pigs for slaughter. You have the butcher there accounting for about 1.2%. So the butcher will go to the farmer by directly. Uh, the farmer direct to the slaughterhouse, uh, there's only about 10.2% um, of farmers who sell directly to the slaughterhouses. Middlemen also come in and play a role there. So they will buy, then go and sell either to the butcher or to the, uh, to the slaughterhouse. They're accounting for 2.4%. And there are traders in between there as well, who are the majority, accounting for 86.2%. So you can see as you're talking about the value chain, there's the farmers, but then again, you're looking at the butchers, the middlemen, and the traders who come to pay. Uh, transport is another node in this system as well. So majority of the time, uh, the traders or the butchers or the uh, middlemen would be uh, buying these pigs and loading them onto pickups, uh, saloon cars. Border borders are uh, motorbikes. Uh, that's the local term in Kenya. So either getting onto border borders or bicycles. Not the best way to transport the pigs. So when you're looking at it from a welfare point of view and from um, what I was talking about, the impression that consumers get, once they see pigs being transported like this, again, uh, they may not eat them by virtue of the, or they might not buy pork by virtue of the fact that they, that they, are, they are not very happy with how they're seeing the pigs being treated. As a mode of disease transmission, again, moving from farm to farm, uh, collecting or amassing the pigs, uh, then is another area that we need to consider or that needs to be controlled if we are to get a hold of uh, the spread of African safety. A majority of the pigs from this system go into local slaughter. So you're looking at small to medium-sized slaughterhouses and uh, slaughter slabs. Um, and the consumption of uh, pork produced in this system would then be mostly uh, local. So they're uh, sold as fresh pork without any value addition. Um, 
and this would be either in pork joints or uh, butcher, uh, butcheries to the local population. Uh, another hallmark in this system, again, is that um, prices paid might be very low depending on uh, the season because there is not usually a formal way to weigh the pigs. So the trader or the butcher coming to the farmer because they're buying straight from the farm would give an estimate of uh, the weight if there is no other way of weighing them. And uh, most of the time payment would then be made on uh, the live weight as opposed to the kill out or carcass weight is uh, the more formal uh, slaughter of weight of the page. Um, I have highlighted this because we were, as pharmacists, we were involved in uh, the study that was carried out by Dr. Murungi and uh, et al. just to look at the Nairobi pork value chain. I believe it is a good representation of what is happening throughout the region. And this um, flowcharts basically highlight what would be happening in the small scale farmers. I think I'll just highlight on the one that says uh, Nairobi informal settlement that is basically looking at um, the source of water and feed and the flow of animals now from the farms and all the way to the final consumer. So he's highlighted there that bohol was the, water was the main source of water with feed being uh, swill and concentrates to some extent. Um, sourcing of animals would either be from other farms or uh, actually just from other farms and from neighbors. Uh, small scale, this would mostly fall in the small scale category. So in this case, you have a farmer with one sow, no boar at all, three to five piglets in one case. You have your medium scale farmer in this category with two boars, uh, two sows, sorry, one boar, six to seven piglets. And on the larger scale, you would have at least 10 sows or more, two to three boars and 10 piglets. And the trade uh, at this level would be either piglets and winners uh, that would be going straight uh, to butchers and brokers or farmers for further rearing or fattening, and then to the abattoir. Uh, you have sows and boars in some cases that uh, go to butchers and brokers or other farmers. Uh, the sows, if they're being culled, then end up in the, area, in the slaughterhouse, sorry. And then you would have finishers also going to other uh, farmers, brokers, butchers. Um, then there's home slaughtering as well and then ending up with the consumer. The other products that comes out of the system would be manure, and this would mostly end up in, uh, with crop farms. Again, if you look at all this, there's the element of how the manure is handled and looking at it as being a source of uh, disease spread as well. Uh, the other one highlighting Nairobi and urban areas, basically almost the same thing, but you're looking now at a farmer with a larger number of animals, slightly larger number of animals. Um, again, water would be from boreholes. Feed is a mix of uh, swill and concentrates. But in this case, we will also have the farmer. The last, uh, um, do I say box, it talks about the integrated company that basically would be selling pregnant sows to the larger farmers in this category, and then the pigs will end up either in a slaughterhouse or uh, to the butchers and then to the consumers there. But there's also the element of consent. So that is a good representation that I feel would cover what is happening in most of the regions or throughout the, uh, in the countries in the East Africa region. I have photos there just showing what is happening or what happens in the small scale system. You have pigs scavenging in dump sites and just you know walking long distance to to get uh, feed without um, any concern to biosecurity or even what this is doing in terms of the feed efficiency or conversions. You can say that, and that is one of the reasons why they take too long to get to slaughter, and uh, the prices paid for such pigs will be. Uh, the transport modes that I, I had highlighted. You have the motorbike there, you have a pickup, yeah, and you can see even just from a welfare point of view, this is not right. The pickup possibly um, acceptable, but you would need to ensure that there's no overloading. But again, just from a disease spread point of view, I think all of us would see that this can pose quite a serious risk. Um, 
So I'll move on to the small uh, to medium scale or semi-intensive uh, system where we have about five to 500 cells. In this case, there's been um, significant investment in improving genetics, and this would be sourced from either private or government institutions, and sometimes even from neighbors. So you'd have someone knowing that my neighbor has invested in genetics, so when they have uh, piglets or gills, they would buy from the neighbors to improve their genetics. Um, use of the communal boar happens, and again, looking at uh, spread of disease, that would not be the ideal way. Uh, there's AI in some cases. AI is not so common in the region at this particular point in time, but it is, um, yeah, you know, there's uh, increased awareness and uh, it has been, it is starting to be used in a bigger way in this uh, system, but the main constraint is the cost of it. So AI is used in some cases, and again, this is used to improve genetics. Uh, feed is mostly commercial, but in some cases, depending on uh, cost, you would get supplementation with swill and kitchen waste. And you also have those farmers who would choose to do their own mix. And all this is in an effort to control costs. Um, currently, and I think um, in most uh, countries at the moment, feed cost is quite high. And as we know, in this uh, system, feed cost contributes about 70 to 80 percent of our production cost. So any change in price would uh, push these farmers to look at the uh, supplementing with seal or kitchen waste just to try and manage the production. Um, here we would see improved husbandry practices um, coupled with access to veterinary and extension services. And um, this would also go hand in hand with the house, uh, better housing being provided. So if you're looking at that from uh, managing or controlling disease, then you have a better uh, picture here or better placement here than when compared to the small scale farm. The semi-permanent buildings, uh, permanent buildings using locally available materials. So biosecurity would be much better in this case. Majority would be doing farrow to finish units. Um, and you also have a small percentage that sell off units. Because remember from the small scale uh, system, you had uh, farmers preferring to buy piglets or winners and then fattening them uh, to slaughter weeds. There's improved access to markets and market information. Uh, market weight is higher. So you're getting um, at a younger age, not the 10 months we saw on the, on the other system. So you have uh, producers or farmers at this level getting better uh, payment for their pork. And I think I've already alluded to this, you have better biosecurity knowledge and implementation of this kind of system. Uh, majority of the farmers sell directly to slaughterhouses or to butchers and traders. Uh, and some of these farmers may be contracted. For example, as I highlighted at the start in our case, we contract farmers just to ensure that uh, we are able to get the number of feeds that we want. And by extension there, we try and come in and also now dictate uh, how they keep their pigs, how they feed them. And uh, that extension uh, service then comes back to ensure that the quality of the pig we get at slaughter is what we want. So you have higher number of pigs sourced from one farm. Uh, as opposed to the other system where we're seeing the traders and the butchers have to move from one farm to another and they're getting the pigs. So this again comes back to saying we would have improved better biosecurity in this system. Um, they would be working with medium to large size slaughterhouses or their own slaughter slabs, although their own slaughter slabs are quite rare. So the advantage of this system or uh, dealing with slaughterhouses, you have a proper layerage, you would have clean water, you have chillers or oil rooms, uh, there's meat inspection, so the quality of the meat is assured. You have standing and bleeding areas, so again, we are looking at uh, better um, welfare. You have waste management, so that reduces the risk of contaminating the environment and disease uh, spread. And you'd be dealing mostly with trained personnel when you're looking at this uh, sort of things. Transport is better organized, so you have pickups and trucks in this case. And consumption, again, would go through uh, three levels. You have your local butchers, you have pork joints. And if they're dealing with a larger uh, facility or a processing facility, then the pork would go through further process. Again, this is just highlighting from the same study, the Nairobi pork value chain, highlighting uh, various um, parts, if I can call them that, that uh, the pigs would be going to. So you have your life, and the outputs would be your live pigs, manure, blood, fur, 
the offal, um, the pork head, the pork itself head, you know, all the fresh meat. And uh, this can either go to uh, consumers direct as fresh meat or go to uh, for further processing. But we also have uh, small processing companies also coming into play at this point in time. Uh, we have, uh, I believe in, in Kenya, which I believe I know that we have um, some farmers who have decided to integrate in, uh, to some level, not processing a lot of products, but actually just adding value, maybe providing a few cuts, fresh cuts, and producing sausages. So that is also coming up in a way, and for them, it's just a way of also trying to increase uh, their incomes generated from the pork production processes. Um, so that's a variety of housing that you would get in a small, a medium scale uh, or semi-intensive production. And uh, some of the images are showing the kind of feed. So the supplementation, uh, the image at the top right, left hand in my case, is showing uh, the pigs being fed on kale. But this was also supplemented with commercial feed. Uh, there's a trough. It's not very clear there, but there's a trough on one end there. Uh, the same with the picture below that, just showing uh, corn or maize stocks are offered to the pigs. You can see the building is actually uh, permanent stone and timber in some cases and um, partially open. Um, I think the key thing here would be to look at the flooring and uh, when you're thinking about disinfection and cleaning out uh, to, uh, and disease spread, to look at how this would work. And then the open uh, windows or ventilation would also be another risk that uh, factor in. But with good biosecurity, such uh, um, systems would be able to actually keep out disease to a larger extent. Uh, the transportation there, and, uh, so you have trucks that uh, would be delivering the pigs to slaughter. These images are actually from our own um, slaughterhouse where you get the pigs in trucks and uh, the farmers are usually advised on how to load the pigs how many to load in a truck, um, conditions, if it's too hot, you know, they need to be have a shed netting covering and all, and then they are offloaded and allowed to spend the night at the layerage just so that they can, um, uh, the quality of the meat is assured, you know, get them to rest before the seat. Um, but at the bottom there, you can see uh, a slaughter facility. The previous speaker also highlighted some of the activities. You can see this is being done on the floor, uh, not the best in terms of hygiene and food safety. And again, from a disease uh, spread point of view, this would not be the ideal way to, to do it. So I'll move on to the intensive system where we have uh, more than 500 sows. In this case, we have investment in uh, world-class genetics, often imported from Europe or America, and there are proper breeding strategies in place. Um, so of course, this would come with high investment in housing and management, uh, labor, pipes, and treated water, biosecurity, and of course, all this then lead to better gains. So vertical integration is quite common systems. So in, this is just a way of trying to control the production parameters. For example, in our case, uh, having our own farms just means that uh, with our biosecurity in place, we are assured that in case anything happens to our producers, we have our own pigs that can then, we can either downscale or increase numbers to ensure that we never run out of pigs at any one time. This also helps in controlling feed costs. If you're able to produce your own feed, you're buying uh, material straight from the market. So you're able to control or negotiate better costs. Uh, AI is favored over natural mating in this system. Again, with the investment, AI, although I'd mentioned quite uh, costly for the small scale or medium scale farmer, in this case, it is uh, favored by security as one. And then with the breeding strategies in place, then this has to be is the best choice in terms of uh, um, acquiring genetic gains. Uh, feeds are high quality commercial feeds situated, suited, sorry, to the different classes of pigs. Uh, so you would find a farmer using about, uh, on average, about three different types of feeds. So you would have a feed for your piglets, a feed for your lactating sows or dry sows, and a feed for the growing pan. But in some cases, you can find feeds all the way up to seven or eight feeds being utilized in one, in one system or in one farm. 
there's access to good veterinary services coupled with the high biosecurity. So low disease burden and mortality, again, managing or bringing down production costs and uh, keeping down out disease. Uh, market weights are attained at a young age, less than six months, and the weights are quite high. So in our case, for example, we are able to take our pigs to slaughter at five months of age and uh, at a live weight of uh, an average of 100 kilos. Waste management strategies are in place. Um, you would find, for example, you have uh, uh, effluent ponds to manage the liquid waste. You have maybe composting pits to compost the manure before it's released uh, or to allow treatment before it is released to farmers for fertilizer. You would have um, condemnation pits, incinerators uh, for your carcasses. So you are able to actually, in case there's an outbreak or anything, you're better able to control uh, disease or uh, minimize spread of material. There's structured and better market access in this kind of system. So the farmers are getting better pay for their uh, pigs. So the quality is uh, at the top. Uh, the age to slaughter is quite young at high weight. And um, although the investment is quite high, the farmer in most cases is able to make good, uh, good profits from such systems. And I've put there an example ourselves in Kenya, Farmer Stress Limited. And there is a company in Uganda that I've interacted with quite a lot called Breeds, Feeds, and Meats. And uh, there's also another one in Uganda as well called the uh, that I've uh, interacted with and seen that basically they are also copying the same system of vertical integration. <clears throat> so I've already talked about uh, the, such system producing high numbers. They're dealing with medium to large scale slaughterhouses. Uh, payment is done on cold rest weight after slaughter. I highlighted at the beginning that the other system will be paid on uh, a live weight as opposed to kill out weight. Transport is welfare friendly and you mostly find, find trucks being utilized in this case. And uh, this system goes ahead, uh, uh, besides providing fresh pork uh, to process further. So you'd have things like sausages, uh, hams coming out of the pork that is produced in this kind of system. Markets uh, would be mostly the high-end retailers. Uh, so you're looking at your supermarkets, uh, hotels, restaurants, and there's also a percentage that would be going to the export. Um, so this is a representation again from the study from the Nairobi Pork Value Chain, highlighting uh, the pathways or the systems that uh, the pigs are, the, Pigs producing this system would go through for the inputs before ending into uh, ending up at the consumer level. So imports uh, semen from European countries, uh, either semen or live animals. Um, and this is basically highlighting the system that we have in place here, farmers' trees. So we have our own farms. Uh, at this time, uh, we were producing 50% because the study was done in 2021. We were producing 50% of what we slaughter. This has now shifted. We, we are down to 30% from our own farms, and our contracted farmers and others are producing about 70 to 75%, depending on the time of the year. So we have uh, company vehicles transporting the pigs, and we transport both our own pigs from our own farms and also offer transport to our farmers. Again, quite um, a way of controlling disease just safeguarding, I would say safeguarding our interests at the end of the day, because we want to ensure that there's continuity in production. So by sending trucks that we are sure have been uh, disinfected, that we know are going to a specific area, as opposed to moving from one place to another, we are able to control uh, disease spread and then the quality of meat that will be coming to us. Uh, there are some farmers who transport in their own vehicles, but as I, I highlighted, we then give them standards that should be met um, for the, uh, the animals to pass uh, inspection on arrival at the slaughterhouse. Uh, then, of course, from the abattoir, you have the fresh pork I'd mentioned. You have value-added products. Uh, there's blood that undergoes further processing uh, to extract plasma. Uh, there's manure from our farms and then have the other farmers as well that would go to crop farming. There are some uh, bits and pieces that would be incinerated in the farm that we are not yet using for anything or any co uh, condemned uh, 
carcass would be incinerated. We work with um, export license. Uh, we are an export license slaughterhouse, so we work with government veterinarians for anti-mortem and post-mortem inspection and for quality control throughout production. So again, um, this would be lacking where you have uh, local slaughter on the slaughter slabs or small slaughterhouses. And again, just assuring uh, safety, uh, both to the farmers. So there's nothing that can come from the slaughterhouse to go back to the farms or um, uh, into the products that would then affect you. Um, the offals are sold off to traders who then sell this into the formal markets. So getting to the, um, get the consumer through that route. And then there are products that we export um, within the region. And again, as I pointed out at the start, there's also an element of importation. So we import different cuts. Majority of the time, it will be bellies and hams um, that come from across the world. Uh, we've worked, we've imported from Germany, we've imported from Canada, we've imported from Argentina, um, and which other country. So when you're looking at disease spread, with, this, uh, with disease in Europe again, biosecurity and all, um, our veterinary authorities then have to come into play and certify that the meat is coming from areas where uh, there are areas that have been certified free of uh, African swine fever and other diseases of uh, interest. So again, that would come in and then be processed in the same way. Majority of that goes into production of harms and uh, um, bacon, streaky bacon especially, and that goes into the local market again for export. So I think the, just a good representation of uh, what the value chains would look like in the different systems from this study. I know it is uh, based in Nairobi and its environs, but I think it would represent quite well what is happening through the region. And from listening to previous speakers, I think this would be the case. So some images there of uh, housing. This is from our own farms again. Uh, you can see there we have sows housed in group housing, uh, permanent structures, they are bedding throughout. Uh, again, welfare friendly, easy to clean. When you come to disinfecting, we practice uh, all in all out system. So when the animals move out, the entire building Uh, again, as uh, we look at value, Can you hear me? Seems I went offline. For... Yes, Sharon. I, I don't know whether it was on our side or on your side, but we, we lost you for a minute. Yeah. Um, please proceed, but try to finish in the next two minutes because we're yeah. widely over time now, and we need okay. to give some time to the to the uh, participants. I think, well. Yeah, I have about three more slides. Um, you can see my. Screen? No, you must have lost uh, the screen sharing as well when you dropped out. Uh... Okay. Let me just go back to that. Now? It's coming. Okay. So I think I've gotten there just highlighting the different uh, or the housing systems in uh, a large scale producer, in this case ourselves. Um, uh, the same continues in the next slide. And then biosecurity measures in place just to keep out disease. You can see there's their vehicle ditch there to access the farms, their gates with um, sign boards or uh, notices just confirming that these are high health areas and the visitors are not allowed. 
uh, without um, prior authorization. This is what would be happening in the slaughterhouse. I talked about stunning, singeing. You're seeing the animals are hanged there uh, for splitting, and uh, from there you would go into the um, marketing in this case, you're seeing the processed products or fresh products, demonstrations, this would be in supermarkets at this place there. You would have your marketing teams going out and uh, online, uh, let's say marketing and posters that would go out from, from time to time. So as I said, marketing is quite uh, well organized in this case. Um, my references there, but I will finish off by just highlighting that uh, <laughs> I hadn't put this in a slide, but my conclusions would basically be pointing out to the fact that there's a demand in the, there's expected increase in demand of pork products, and we therefore need to look um, at uh, ways of investing in the industry. Significant investment is required across all the value chains. So we would be looking at saying, what do we need to do? And one of the ways to ensure we are able to meet this increased demand is to look at managing or controlling disease. Uh, we require better coordination. I think the speaker just prior had talked about this, better coordination at the different levels in the value chain to ensure, first of all, to guarantee markets and to ensure that uh, benefits are acquired throughout the value chain. You know, anyone involved in the value chain is actually earning something, earning a livelihood from it, as opposed to just being uh, ad hoc or a hazard where there's no coordination at all. Uh, policy formulation is required, so we require for policies in place that would support uh, growth in the pig industry. And then we also need to look at a point where we can guarantee competitiveness throughout the system. Because there are quite a few constraints that uh, come into play that uh, reduce competitiveness, even when you're looking at the export market. So you're looking at infrastructure in the different countries, political climates, the cost of regulations related to labor, so labor costs are related that, and then the cost of things like fuel and electricity that we all go into, uh, the different nodes of the value chain to ensure productivity, increased productivity and profitability to the players. So that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, is it possible for you to briefly?